Good morning and welcome to Blackstone Valley United Methodist Church as we gather to worship today, whether you are here in the sanctuary as some of you are or you're joining us from the comfort of your own home. We are glad you are taking this time to worship together. This is the second Sunday of Lent, so we're going to continue exploring our walk in the wilderness as we seek to find our way home to God. And today we're going to be looking at the practice of lament. So let us enter into a time of worship by joining in our call to worship. Pilgrims, we are invited to journey through this season of Lent toward the one who calls us by a new name. Disciples, we walk with Jesus wherever he leads us, pulling our fears, our doubts, our longings behind us. Believers, we seek to trust the God who always surprises us, whose promises take on flesh and blood in the good news called Jesus. So I want to tell you a little story from the book of Genesis, which is in the Old Testament. You know about how the Bible is divided into the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the thing we don't always stop to remember is that the Old Testament was already around when Jesus was alive. So these are the stories that Jesus knew that formed his faith. And this story in Genesis is a story about Abram. It tells us that when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said to him, I am God. Walk with me and be trustworthy. I will make a covenant. A covenant is a special kind of promise, right? A covenant between us and I will give you many, many descendants. Abram fell on his face and God said to him, but me, my covenant is with you and you will be the ancestor of many nations. Which is kind of a strange thing because Abram was 99 and his wife Sarai was almost the same age and they'd never had any children, yet God was telling him he was gonna be the father of many nations. And God says, and because I have made you the ancestor of many nations, your name will no longer be Abram, but Abraham. I will make you very fertile. I will produce nations from you and kings will come from you. I will set up my covenant with you and your descendants after you in every generation as an enduring covenant. I will be your gods and your descendants God after you. And then we skip a few verses and then God says to Abraham, as for your wife Sarai, you will no longer call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and even give you a son from her. I will bless her so that she will become nations and kings of people will come from her. 
So we all have a name, right? And, and we have full names as well. I knew, knew someone who used to talk about them as dress-up names. Because right? her father's name was Bob, but she always said, his dress-up name is Robert. Well, last week we talked some about promises. And God made a promise with Noah and gave him a rainbow to remember that promise. Now this week, our Bible story tells us that God made a promise to Abram, Abram and Sarai, that they would have a son. That son we later know is Isaac. And that they and all of Isaac's family after him would be God's people, that God would bless them, that they would know and love God and live in God's way. And to remind them of this promise, God gave them new names, right? Naming them Abraham and Sarah. So what would you think if God changed your name? God blessed Abraham's son Ishmael too. Abraham ends up having two sons. And God said the promise is between God and all of Abraham's family and it'll last forever. So today there are people all around the world from many nations who think of themselves as children of Abraham. Jews are his children because Isaac and Abraham were their family. Muslims are his children because Ishmael and Abraham were his family. And Christians are children of Abraham because we share the same trust in God and God adopts us into the family. So what about you? Are you a child of Abraham too? You know what? We all are. And we all share that name, right? Child of God. You, me, everybody. We are blessed children of God so that we can be a blessing to others. And let us pray. Loving and promising God, you have blessed so many people. Bless me too so that I can bless others. Help me to be a part of your people. Help me to live a life the way you want me to live. Amen. And Carolyn's going to read our scripture for us. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders, and the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days arise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him, and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Je Peter, and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not the side of God, but of men. Then he called to the multitude with his disciples and said to them, If any man could come after me, let, the, let him deny himself and take his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what a man can give in return for his life. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this alderous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Carol. Let us pray. God, we have gathered here to be in your presence, to hear your word for us through scripture, through music, through prayer, and through knowing that we are in this time together. So may my words and the meditations of all of our heart be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So there's something about Peter, right? He seems to sort of go back and forth between being the most insightful disciple to being the most clueless disciple. And I don't always know what to make of his comments. 
And I often wonder what the gospel writers were thinking when they portray him this way, that they have him say something so profound in one passage and just a few verses later say something where he just puts his foot in his mouth. I mean, how does he miss the point so often and yet he becomes the rock on which the church is built? I mean, are we meant to identify with him as we try to figure out what it means for us to be disciples of Christ? Perhaps. Well, in this passage that Caroline just read for us, Jesus is explaining what's going to happen. And Peter doesn't like it. You see, he doesn't have the same lens that we do. He doesn't know about Easter yet. It's really hard for us to remember that when we read this passage, but he doesn't know yet. All he knows is that he doesn't want anything bad to happen to his friend Jesus. And so it makes me wonder if maybe we kind of misunderstand Jesus' rebuke if we think that Peter is just clueless and hopeless. We hear it as though Peter did or said the wrong thing. But maybe Jesus is simply responding to his fear, acknowledging the fear that Peter expresses and then saying, we still have to have things that we don't like be a part of the journey. So we've been exploring Lenten practices this Lent. We're being guided in part by the Lenten study book that some of us are using called Walking in the Wilderness by Beth A. Richardson. It's a book of daily devotionals. And then on each Sunday, she offers us a spiritual practice to work on throughout the week. Last week was presence, and this week is lament. So when I read Peter's objections as a lament, He's no longer the disciple who's trying to change God's plan. He's no longer the guy who doesn't get it. He's clearly the disciple who loves Jesus and has simply had enough. And he's expressing his sincere desire for things to be different. Enough of this talk of suffering and death. Peter is being brutally honest about his own fears and his desires in this passage. And Jesus acknowledges that this pain is real when he says that his disciples have to take up the cross and follow. Now, depending on how you count it, today is either the second Sunday in Lent or the 50th in this never-ending Lent that began a year ago. And Lent is a time we traditionally take stock of our lives and how we practice our faith. We strive to let go of our bad habits and try new ways of living more fully into our beliefs. It's sort of a 40-day boot camp for aligning our walk with our talk. Last week, we talked about presence, about learning to be in the moment instead of dwelling on the past or jumping ahead to an imagined future thinking of Lent as a time to stop running from the dark, to stop avoiding the wilderness and the deserts and lean in, be fully present, spend time in those places, and remember that everywhere and always, God is with us, near us, and in us. And this week, it's the practice of lament. Lament is a prayer that comes from our deep pain and distress. Lament gives voice to our most intimate feelings, our deepest longings. We bring our deepest pain before God and express our sadness, our anger. We ask, why? Why me? Lament is about being honest with our feelings. It's how we grapple with the pain of life and the goodness of God and try and figure out how those two things exist side by side. Lament is a gift as we walk in the wilderness. It offers us a way to express that pain. 
Esther Fleece in her book, No More Faking Fine, Ending the Pretending, writes, there is no healing in hurrying through grief. There is no restoration in ignoring pain. Rather, healing is found when we learn to lament honestly. Well, lament seems to be a lost art these days. We tend to stuff our feelings to put our best foot forward. And so I think we do need to reclaim this art of lament to be honest with ourselves before God. So how do we do this? Well, there's a formula for lament, a simple form often found in the Psalms. About a third of the Psalms are actually Psalms of lament. And all of those Psalms contain four parts, the address, the lament, the petition, the thanksgiving. So let's look at each of these parts a little more so that we might be able to begin practicing this lost art. Now address is simply how we call to God. All of the laments in scripture are addressed directly to God. And there are many names for God. You can try one that already exists or you can make up your own. You might address God as Heavenly Father or Mothering God as Almighty God or as Hidden God. You can look at the Psalms for inspiration or you can search the internet for names of God. Listen with your heart and listen to your pain. Maybe your lament is addressed to God of the brokenhearted. The second part of the form is the actual lament, right? After you call on God, boldly and directly speaking God's name, you get a little more introspective. So to prepare yourself for this part, think about how you truly feel, right? Are you angry? Are you sad? Are you lost? Look for words that capture the depth of your lament. Go beyond sort of those basic words we use. Ask yourself questions. What is it that's breaking your heart? What is it you're mourning? What wounds are you nursing? What is causing you pain? Answer these questions honestly. Name them. God already knows that you're hurting. So your words are not going to come as a shock to God. When you confront your most painful feelings and fears and you bring them directly to God, you're really leaning into Lent and learning to lament. In your prayers of lament, you can ask questions, even though you know you may not get the answers, or at least not the answers you want. In fact, one of the gifts of lament is realizing that not everything has an easy answer. Acknowledging your moments of deep pain can bring you to a holy place. Remembering that Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus himself, sits beside you in your pain. The third part of the form of lament is petition that's asking for what you want. So you really have to stop and think about this part. It's one thing to sort of name where you are, but what is it you want? What are you asking God to do? If you read through the Psalms, you hear all kinds of things, asking God to uh, get rid of one's enemies or asking God to heal a broken heart. So speak up and be direct. What is it you want to have happen? How are you asking God to be present? How are you asking God to intervene? And then finally, we come to thanksgiving. Psalms of lament generally end in praise. In Psalm 13, it's, I trust you in your unfailing love. Psalm 27, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. 
Psalm 42, I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Know that it's not hypocritical or trite to praise God in the midst of uncertainty. In fact, lament opens us up to an authentic hope, a very real hope of trusting in God's unfailing love, even in the midst of pain. So as we make our way through the wilderness this Lent, as we try to find our way home to God, lament is one of those paths. In the commentary, Feasting on the Word, Joseph D. Small talks about Martin Luther's theology of glory and theology of the cross. The theology of glory is built on assumptions of the way that God is expected to act in the world you know, our almighty, always present, all-powerful God. And then the theology of the cross is grounded in God's self-revelation in Jesus, in suffering and death, in what looks like weakness. So just like Peter in this passage, what we expect from God is glory, and Jesus contradicts that expectation, and we're left learning how to navigate with these two very different, very present theologies. Lament helps us to name this contradiction. It helps us to make sense of it on some level. It's the practice of mourning what is wrong in the world and calling on God to repair it. So when was the last time you expressed your hurt or pain to God with such honesty? When was the last time you were real with God about what was going on inside your heart? Well, this is the week to try it. Amen. As we unite our hearts in prayer, I remind those of you at home that you are welcome to add your prayer concerns into the comments on Facebook so that we might join in praying with you. This has been one of those weeks where I have heard a lot of prayer needs. Oh God, we come before you this morning trusting in your presence and your grace. We come with lots of questions about people who are sick and suffering, people who are grieving, 
We ask that you just be present with them through this time and that you might show us how we might be a help in their time of distress. We thank you for the angels, seen and unseen, that minister among us. And God, you know how weary we are of this pandemic. We're tired of wearing masks. We're tired of not singing. We're tired of trying to maintain six feet of space. We see the hope in the vaccines. And we see the frustration in trying to get everyone vaccinated in a timely manner. Grant us more patience that we might get through this in-between time. As we look forward to that day when things will be different again. Lord, all of this we bring before you, trusting that you will sort it out. And so as we gather, we pray the words that your son teaches us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We think so often of our offerings as something we put in a little envelope and place on a plate. But our generosity goes beyond just those gifts. And so this morning, I thank you for the generous offerings of food that you have provided over the past couple of months for the Northbridge Food Pantry. Beginning next week and throughout the month of March, we're collecting for the Sutton Food Pantry. That's the thing about being a church for a uh, larger community is that we have more opportunities to reach out. These offerings for our neighbors are a tangible expression of our love. And so I invite you to give generously. Let us stand and hear the doxology. <laughs> May be seated. Let us pray. God of us all, you love us and have claimed us. You have invited us into the blessing of connection within the family of humanity whom you continue to bless. We give our tithes and our offering and our gifts of food and supplies in celebration of the depths of your blessing. And we pray that they will strengthen the church across the world and bless all your children. In the holy name of Christ, our Savior and Redeemer, we pray in gratitude. Amen. I invite you this morning around 11 o'clock to log on to the Zoom coffee hour. The link is in the e-news, and if you can't find the e-news in your email inbox, the e-news is available on our Facebook site as well. It's a different login this week. Tom Dill is hosting our time together because I have another meeting. 
I also invite you this week on Wednesday at noon to Village Congregational Church for the Northbridge Association of Churches Lenten Wednesday Sermon Series. I will be preaching this Wednesday. If you're unable to join us in person, it will be live streamed. Um, we'll get that information on how to access that out and we will put the recording on Facebook as well. And then on the 10th, it'll be here. So now, go in God's power that moves through acts of faith. Open your ear to God's divine revelations. Depend on God who is wise beyond the laws of this land. Do all these things so that all that is right and good permeates each day until we meet again. And all God's people say,